So for the second part of our culture unit, we are going to review language. Here is a great infographic just about the most spoken languages. And again, you can see that the most spoken first language in the world is Mandarin Chinese. So the big ideas that we're going to cover are language family, dialects, diversions, and convergence, the diffusion of language, the distribution of language families, the disappearance of language, revived and artificial language, spatial interactions, and toponyms. So language is a system of communication through speech, a collection of sounds that a group of people understand to have the same meaning. Many countries designate at least one official language to be used for official documents and public objects like road signs and money. So uh, language can be organized into families, which are a collection related through common ancestral language, branches, which are collections within a family, and groups, which are collections within a branch that share common origin in the relatively recent past. They're going to display similar grammar and vocabulary. So really, it's kind of about how long ago those languages split off in terms of family, branch, and group. So here we see the Indo-European language. And so the Indo-European is the language family. Then we have the various branches with Indo-Iranian, Celtic, Slavic, Germanic, and so forth. Then we also have groups within that with like the Iranian group, and then we have the actual languages. At the global scale, we classify languages into language families. The languages have a shared but fairly distant origin. Families are broken down into subfamilies, divisions within a language family. Commonalities are more de definite and origins are more recent. They consist of individual languages and smaller in spatial extent. Two thirds of the world's population speaks a language that belongs to the Indo-European or Sino-Tibetan language family. So those are the two largest language families, Indo-European being the largest. Two to 6% of the world's population speaks a language that fits into one of the other seven major language families. Remainder of the population speaks a language belonging to one of the other hundreds, much smaller families. Dialects are variants of a standard language along regional or ethnic lines. There's differences in vocabulary, syntax, pronunciation, cadence, and pace of speech. Linguists think about dialects in terms of chains. They're distributed across space. Those nearest to each other geographically will be the most similar. They can be marked by actual differences in vocabulary. So linguistic geographers map the extent of which particular words marking their limits as isoglosses. Isoglosses, remember, are those language boundaries. So here we see a map of isogloss for the name of a soft drink. Different parts of the United States, depending on their different dialects, call soft drinks different things. We also have an isogloss between where people mainly say y'all versus you guys. Language divergence is when a lack of spatial interaction among speakers breaks the language into dialects and then eventually new languages. When the Roman Empire disintegrated, places within the region discontinued interaction, prompting a round of linguistic divergence. So what was originally all Latin spoken around the Mediterranean became first different dialects of Latin, and then over time became so different, it turned into different languages, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and so forth. Language convergence. If people with different languages have consistent spatial interaction, convergence can take place. Two languages can become one. For example, Frankish traders revitalized the ports of the Eastern Mediterranean. Local traders did not speak the language, so Frankish was mixed with Italian, Greek, Spanish, and Arabic. So this creates special problems for researchers because the rules of reconstruction may not apply or be unreliable to reconstruct and figure out what language is what. Language diffusion. Several theories uh, hypothesize how, why, and where languages diffuse over time. Each varies according to the uh, impetus for diffusion. One commonality is a focus on Europe. So there's uh, different uh, theories about how the Indo-European language family originated. And you do need to know these two theories, the conquest theory and the agricultural theory.
So the conquest theory says that the early speakers of the Indo-European language family spread from east to west on horseback, overpowering early inhabitants and beginning the diffusion and differentiation of the Indo-European languages. The sound shifts in uh, the language represent a long period of divergence in language as one moves west through Europe and east through South Asia. The agriculture theory says that the Indo-European language started in uh, what is today Turkey, which historically was called Anatolia, and that with increased food supply and increased population, the speakers from that hearth just migrated into Europe and into South Asia. So the two largest language families, again, are the Indo-European and Sino-Tibetan. The Indo-European language family is mainly found in Europe, South Asia, North America, and Latin America. The Sino-Tibetan language family is mainly in East Asia, and uh, Chinese being the main language. There are five different dialects of Chinese, but Mandarin is the most used. So you should absolutely know this map in terms of both languages and language families and where they are found. So the language family you need to know the most about is the Indo-European language family. You should also know the four major branches of the Indo-European family. The first is uh, the Germanic branch, which is primarily spoken in Northwestern Europe and North America. It's divided into subgroups known as High and Low Germanic. English is classified in the Low Germanic group, along with German, meaning that we have the most in common with German. The Indo-Iranian uh, branch is found mainly in South Asia, and most speakers of uh, this language branch, and they're subdivided into the Indic group, which are mainly languages found in India and Pakistan, and the Western group, which is mainly uh, Iranian, or Farsi being the main Iranian language. The third branch you should know is the Balto-Slavic branch, which is mainly found in Eastern Europe, with uh, the Eastern Slavic and Baltic groups like Russian and Ukrainian, and the West and Southern Slavic groups like Polish, Czech, Slovak, and Serbio-Croatian. The fourth uh, uh, language branch of Indo-European you should know is the Romance branch, named so because of the Romans, and again, these are those languages that derive from Latin. So Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and Romanian. The disappearance of languages. Language extinction creates branches on the language tree with dead ends, representing a halt in their interaction between the extinct language and the languages that continued. Linguists predict at least half of the world's 7,000 plus languages will be dead or dying by 2050. So this map shows where most of these endangered languages are located. And most of these endangered languages are indigenous languages, so these small tribal groups. And it's not that these people are dying out, it's that their languages are being overtaken by the larger languages in the area. So for example, in Latin America, these people aren't dying out, but they're choosing to learn Spanish over their native languages. Anthropologist Wade Davis estimates that half of the world's languages are endangered. Most are lost because one group dominates another and the dominant language is privileged. Two dimensions to characterization of endangerment are number of users who identify with a particular language and the number and nature of the users of four functions for which the language is employed. So languages can become extinct when all descendants perish or when they choose to use another language. This does not happen overnight. It takes place across generations. Presently, 473 languages, 46 in Africa, 182 in the Americas, 84 in Asia, 9 in Europe, and 152 in the Pacific are going extinct. So it's possible to deduce a large part of uh, an extinct language. The way that linguists reconstruct these dead languages is through backwards construction, reconstruction. So if you take a look at uh, the Indo-European language family, you'll see several languages that uh, are extinct. The little dagger that kind of looks like a cross means that language is extinct. Now, sometimes it's extinct because it just turned into other languages. Other times it's extinct 
because the speakers just completely abandon it. So there's different reasons for these excuses. A revived language means that it went extinct or almost near extinct, uh, but has intentionally been revived and regained some of its former status. The best example of this is Hebrew. After the Jewish diaspora, Hebrew basically went extinct as a first spoken language. However, even though the Jews around the world were speaking different languages, many of them were learning how to read in Hebrew so that they could read the Torah. And with the Zionist movement, many of them moving back to Israel spoke different languages, but all knew how to read Hebrew. And so many of them started to re-speak Hebrew, and that's how Hebrew started to be revived as a language. And today it is one of the official languages of the country of Israel. An artificial language is a planned language that has been consciously devised instead of having developed naturally. The only example of this is Esperanto, which was created as an attempt to make some type of global language that everybody could learn. A lingua franca is a language used among speakers of different languages for the purpose of trade and commerce. It can be a single language or a mix of two or more. English today has become the major lingua franca around the world. It started with British colonization, but today it's mainly because of U.S. economic dominance. A pidgin language is a language created when people combined parts of two or more language into a simplified structure and vocabulary for basic communication between people who speak different languages. A creole language is when a pidgin has developed into more complex structure and has actually become the native language of a group of people, like a Haitian creole, which is a mix of West African languages and French. Toponyms are place names, and by naming a place, people in effect call that place into being. So geographers call these toponyms, and it imparts a certain character on a place. It reflects, it reflects the social process of a, of a place, and it can give us a glimpse of history of a place. So place names are very, very important. When people change the toponym of a place, they have the power to wipe out the past. Major reasons people change toponyms are after decolonization, after a political revolution, to memorialize people or events, or to commodify or brand a place. So, For example, in Wales, which is on the island of Great Britain, people feared the loss of the Welsh language and despised the role the English had played in diminishing the Welsh language. So they wanted to also boost their local economy and attract tourists. So they renamed their town the original Welsh name. And yes, this entire thing is the name of the town, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But uh, they renamed it in the actual original Welsh. So that concludes it for language. The third and final part of our culture unit is going to be over religion.